Good evening. Welcome, everybody. Hello, Heidi. Hi. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I was just, um, I was just getting my my house to quiet down a little bit because everybody's on conference calls at the same time. No problem. Uh, but this is Cameron. Hey, Cameron. Welcome, welcome. Very, very excited to have you on board. Thank you for having me. I want to welcome. Uh, our participants, we always get far more people on Facebook, I have to say, than directly on Zoom, uh, as Heidi knows. So who knows how many people are out there on Facebook right now live, but they will also probably catch us on recording later on our Facebook page. But I do want to welcome our two guests tonight. Heidi, some of you will know from previous uh, encounters. Uh, we've been co-hosting these talks now, Heidi, for a few months now, huh? Yeah, I think we've done about eight or nine, yeah, since the beginning yeah. of August. Since mm -hmm. the beginning of August, right. It's been a, more than a three-month stretch, and we're hoping to actually elaborate on these and create an actual curriculum for next year. Um, but these have kind of come up because of COVID, I guess, in a sense, where we were wanting to breach the isolation, the social distancing, and, in, and, and bring topical speakers to people and uh, talk about distance learning and online learning and the opportunities that Cambridge brings for international study. And then, of course, a lot of people are looking to, to go abroad and to study uh, internationally with Cambridge International Qualifications. And that's where Heidi comes along because Heidi represents studying abroad, international study advisors, i.e. abroad is her company that she represents and is located in Cape Town, but she has connections all over the world and they do place students all over the world. So we're very, uh, very lucky to have her and to have her organize our speakers. Um, and Tamron is one of those. And tonight it's actually about Aspire, right? Aspire International, which is uh, Aspire Atlantic, beg your pardon, um, which is all about how to go to the United States on a sports scholarship, I believe. And of course, that's a popular topic, right? So that's a common aspiration for a lot of top ranked athletes. So I think you'll probably encounter a lot of questions about how that gets done and um, and how Heidi can facilitate that and then what's required, really. Um, so that's what we will be addressing tonight. Please, I invite you to type your questions, as always, in the Q&A chat box. And keep in mind that you can also send comments on Facebook. They won't be answered tonight live on Facebook, but we will address them afterwards. And, of course, you'll get follow-up emails from Cambry Learn with our details, and you can reach out to Heidi if you need her details. We'll uh, share them with you gladly. Uh, so I think uh, without further ado, because there's a lot on this topic, I'm sure I'm quite interested mm -hmm. in finding out the mechanism. So I'm going to let Heidi introduce you more formally, Tamron, because she knows you better. So Heidi. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So I won't go through. Can you hear me? Because I know yes. I've had. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. um, so I won't go through Tamron's resume. She can do that. But I'll just tell you how um, we kind of connected. And as you know, we work in uh, 13 or 14 countries around the world and have about 250 or 260 university partners. And we often get questions. So we work with a lot of universities in the UK um, who offer sporting scholarships. And we send kids to the UK who do get sporting scholarships, uh, mostly cricket, rugby, netball, hockey, um, squash, and water polo, swimming. But we get a lot of questions about U.S. universities. So, and we, the U.S. universities, as Tam is going to, is the expert, and she is going to um, tell you what it takes to become a student athlete in the USA. And it's a much more involved process than other places in the world, and you need to be a specialist. And I can just say for anybody who's watching now or who's watching in the future, please, please, please avail yourself of the Aspire Atlantic expertise when it comes to this. There are a lot of agents out there who claim to do um, sports scholarships around the world in South Africa. And um, we have we have kind of formed a, a, a referral partnership with Aspire Atlantic. So if anybody approaches me asking about sports scholarships in the United States, I immediately pass them on um, to Tamron at Aspire Atlantic because in our opinion, from the from all of the, the agents that we've come across that in the industry, they know their stuff and they do it well. And I personally know kids who have gone through them and who have gone to university on scholarships. So before we even 
I even approached Tamron about forming a, a referral relationship. I asked those families and the parents and the children for their feedback on, on Aspire and what their services are and how they found it before we even approached them. So we did a bit of background, sorry, Tam. We did some <laughs> PI bit. work on you um, in the background. Um, but it's very important to go, the NCAA, which governs sport, and Tamron will get into this in the States, is has got a huge rule book like this long. You can't even see my hands. Um, and you need to make sure that you're compliant. Um, one thing that I will call out is that we, you know, we, people come to us, they know that we're a free service because our, our, um, our model is a bit backwards and that we're paid by our university partners. Um, Aspire is a bit different. So they are not paid by their university partners. And a lot of that has to do with the NCAA rules. So, that is a very important thing to have your eye on. Um, and in my opinion, every penny, if you're going to get 100% scholarship to play whatever your sport is in America, every penny you spend with Aspire Atlantic will be worth it because you do not want to get to the end where you think you're ready to go and you're not compliant for some reason. So that all that said, I'm going to hand it over to Tamron and you can... Um, and I'm sure um, Hugo will come up with questions and we'll kind of ask questions along the way, but will you tell us about Aspire? Tell us what you do, tell us what you're excited about. Sure, so, so Aspire Atlantic was created in 2015. So we're now in our, our fifth year. Uh, we're a USA University Sports Scholarship Agency. Uh, we like to bridge the gap between talent and students aspiring to study in the States. And, and that's really where the idea came from. You know, we, we've had people that are super talented in South Africa and they haven't been able to get the opportunity to carry on the, with their sports locally. You know, if you try and study medicine at WITS and, and carry on playing your sport, it's going to be extremely difficult. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the time your sport falls away and that passion that you have that you've grown up with and the love that you have for sport tends to fall on the wayside. And what the United States really does well is they are able to balance academics and sport. And not just that, uh, us South Africans, we have this great work ethic that I think the Americans quite like, where we go over, we don't want to complain, we get the job done, we work hard, we rock up to practice. And, and that's why they're so interested in top talent, you know, coming from South Africa itself. Uh, but, but top talent in general, we know Americans are competitive, they like to win. And, and why not do it on the, on the sports field? So, so really that's, that's the gist of what Aspire Atlantic does. Okay. Uh, it's important to know that there, there's quite a few actual sport divisions uh, and associations. So the first one being the NCAA. Now the National Collegiate Athletic Association, they're, they're the one that gives everyone a little bit of a headache. They're the one with a, a lot of rule books, um, but it's not impossible to, to be qualified to play collegiate sport. Um, and one thing, Heidi and Hugo, what, what students want to know is that, you know, if I get qualified for the NCAA, I can get into university, right? Um, for sure, you can. Sometimes you can actually get in, into university easy, more easily than you can get cleared by the NCAA. Uh, and it's mm. just knowing the differences between you know, admissions and, and the sporting rules that is really going to, to help you progress through this process a little bit easier. And that's what we facilitate with. You know, we will assist you with SAT registrations. We build your resume um, and we create a highlights video for you. And we actually target the correct universities for the, for the university coaches. Okay? And a lot of kids come to us and they say, Tamron, you know, I want to go to Princeton or Harvard. And you go, oh, fantastic. <laughs> you know, it, uh, me too. I also want to go there. <laughs> um, but, but it's quite complex. You know, not only are those the top institutes in America, but your, your Ivy Leagues don't actually have sports scholarships. They only have what you call financial aid. Uh, so we have to be very careful which schools and, and coaches that our students are, are wanting to aim for. So going back to the NCAA, there's three divisions within the NCAA, okay? Division one is where everyone wants to be. That's the top division. A lot of those athletes actually get drafted to go professional at, at a later date. So, you know, a Duke, Harvard, Stanford, 
uh, those are your, your, you know, UCLA, Louisiana State, Oregon. Those those schools are producing athletes that are going on to the NFL, Olympic Games. Uh, so those are the top institutes that that our top South African students want to go to, and I don't blame them. So it's amazing facilities, but in order to go Division One, you need to be, you know, top of <laughs> top of the pile. Um, we have various different sports that we cover for. If I use golf, for example, uh, you want to go division one, you've got to be a plus four handicap at least. Um, sure. and, and that's, that's tough. <laughs> you know, that's almost going pro. Um, and if you wanted to be a tennis player, you have to have what you call a universal tennis rating. So a UTR is what it's known as a lot of South African students, they'll play tennis and they'll play a lot of ITFs. They'll play, um, you know, a lot of the South African circuit, which is great but you need to plan your UTR events to get your tennis rating up, uh, which is which is crucial. So we assist with that as well. Now, division one, as I say, is great, but division two is just as good, okay? You're gonna train as if you were a division one athlete in division two. You're gonna wake up at half past five in the morning, just like every other athlete. You're gonna go do a weight session. You're gonna go to classes until the afternoon. And then once you finish with your classes, you're off to afternoon practice on the field or in the pool. And then you've got still your study study sessions, you know, in the evening till about nine, ten o'clock at night. It's it's a full time, full time job really, being a student athlete. You know, you've got to <laughs> you've got to you've got to be diligent both in the classroom and on the field. So, you know, whether you're going division two or division one, the real difference is really going to be scholarships, with, which I can get into a little bit later. Then you also get division three in the NCAA. Now, division three don't offer sports scholarships at all. They are more academically focused. So, you know, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, everyone knows it as being a top engineering and, you know, university in the world. They, they love sport but they're not going to give you scholarships. They're not going to pay for it. Yeah, they're not going to pay yeah. for it. <laughs> they, they want the next Elon Musk. They, they don't want the next use of Bolt. So, so really, they're not going to invest in their, their athletics, but they do have it if you would like to com- compete and play sports. So, so that's the NCA in a nutshell. It has three divisions. Majority of our students go Division Two, Division One, And there are other associations so just to touch briefly there's the NAIA the can National I ask a, a quick question yes. sorry just on the division one two and three I'm making notes as I talk to you because <laughs> you know I get asked this a lot just so mm. that I know but like squash for instance mm. squash is not a NCAA sport for in many in most places but it's very widely played in the Ivy Leagues Yes. So do they not, do Ivy Leagues not give squash? And water polo is also very widely played in the Ivy Leagues. Do, do they not give any scholarships for squash in the Ivy Leagues, even though it's not an NCAA sport? No, no. So no scholarships whatsoever. You would only get uh, financial aid. So when you apply and you, you, you apply for your financial aid, they would take it into account that you play squash, you know, in your application that you can add that onto your resume for sure. But it's not something that will, they would reward you on. It's not like the, the squash coach will go knocking on admissions door and saying, I want this player. Uh, it's not, it's not that um, you know, hmm. for, on the forefront. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. I think Sorry. Squash. No, that's no, fine. So, so there's there's over one thousand two hundred uh, sporting programs within the NCAA, and yeah, different schools that that play sport. Squash is only played at about forty four schools. Yeah, it's tiny. It really is. Yeah. It's a really really small sport. But I'm sure yeah. it'll grow through the years. Um, you know, hockey, female hockey, female uh, women's hockey was what about. 10 years ago, maybe 100 programs. Now we're seeing it at 400. Really? So, yeah. 400 wow. women's hockey programs. Exactly. Oh, but the catch, the catch is half of them are in D3, so they don't have hockey yeah. scholarships. Yeah. yeah. So Wake yeah. Forest, a friend of mine, you know, his daughter just has been offered a scholarship to Wake Forest. And Wake Forest is Division One, though, isn't it? Yes. It's private. Correct. Yeah, it's it Division is. One. Yeah. Yeah, it's Division One. Yeah. yeah. Um, 
So, so outside the NCA, you have two different leagues: the the NAIA, the National Athletic Intercollegiate Association. They're also a sporting association. They have about two hundred and fifty schools. A lot of it is private schools, uh, faith based schools, so your your Baptist and your Catholic schools. Uh, but they're also super competitive. You know, it's it's not an, it's not something you want to rule out. There's you know another two hundred and fifty schools to look at for majority of sporting wise. So we, ha- we have that as well. And then thirdly, you have the, the National Junior Collegiate Athletic Association, the NJCAA. Now, they are almost a, a feeder towards the NCAA. So for example, if you're struggling academically, uh, but your sport is you know, on par, then you would be able to go to a junior college for a year or two years and then transfer into a four-year institute and go straight into your third year. And sometimes college coaches like that because you've then experienced, you know, college sport for a year or two and you come across more mature, uh, you know, exactly the college system. You're not homesick from, for the last year. Um, and it's a little bit easier to adapt. So sometimes college coaches look for that. Um, but if you qualify academically and athletically for the NCAA, you can compete in any of those associations. So okay. that's the key. Um, so, so Hugo, the, the community colleges that we talked to last yeah. week, so last they week. would fall yeah. into that, the, N, the NJ, yes. yeah. C-A-A. yeah. NJCAA. NJ, yes. am I, co- yeah. NJ. Yeah, so, so, so junior colleges and community colleges are the same. Yes, yes. Same. They are, they are. So originally, I think back in the day, they were all roughly known as junior colleges, and then they started switching across to community colleges more regularly now moving forward. Um, But I mean, they're great places to, as I said, work on your academics, um, get your grades up where they need to be, improve your GPA, and then you can fly and go straight ahead. You know, we've had two swimmers actually do that. They both went to Indian River State College in Florida, and they were swam there for two years. I would say the one athlete needed to work on the academics. The other one didn't. He just wanted to go there because of the coach. And, and then soon after, you know, they were performing really well in the pool. And after a year, they were really offered full scholarships to both D1 swimming programs. So it's definitely a good route to go if you are just short maybe on the academic side to, to go mm-hmm. improve and, and go there. And Indian River in Florida, just to kind of put you in the picture, Hugo, I mean, Hmm. the state of Florida, the the sport in the state of Florida is insane. It's on another level, especially for like swimming, for tennis, um, triathletes. Yeah. So, so, you know, you go to junior college in Florida, you're competing at the same level as a lot of D1 colleges in other parts of the United States. Um, and more people play tennis in the city of Tampa than all of South Africa. Just to give you an idea. It's crazy. crazy right? it's, yeah. it's, it's insane. Yeah. Yeah. But, but it's, it's no better place to play your tennis, you know, mm. to, to go there, work on your tennis. Um, and yeah. I, I, so many tennis pros from America are actually coming through the collegiate system. Mm. So I think it's absolutely fantastic. I'm really impressed with the the model they've got going at the moment, uh, especially, you know, with their tennis. Um, but just to get into more of the NCA and what is required, uh, Hugo, it's quite a complex process. So a, G- <laughs> a GPA out of four, right, uh, in, in the U.S. is um, is what's usually out of four, right, Heidi? Um, yeah. So you need a, a 2.3 GPA. To, that's the bare minimum to go uh, to, to college sports in the States. Okay, so 2.3. And your SAT, bare minimum again, is a 980. So if you pass it, you know, they'll be happy. And, but that's not to say, and I have to tell kids this often, if you get a 980 or a 1,000, and great, you've ticked off your task on the NCAA to-do list. But that doesn't mean you're going to get accepted into your university of choice with that SAT yeah. score. Mm-hmm. Okay. Kids need to, to remember that. Uh, that. The admissions at each university is going to have different requirements. So 
even though the NCA says 980, I would always say achieve a lot higher. <laughs> there's, mm. there's so much more benefit to getting a better SAT score. Um, and then the next key thing is core courses. So what is a core course? Those are the subjects you're taking at high school. All right. Now you need 16 core courses from your grade nine year to matric. All right. Now, it's, it's not too difficult to do, but a lot of kids, because they, they have a vast array of interests in other subjects, they want to take subjects that they're passionate about or they're interested in. And the NCA is not too bothered what, what students are interested in, but rather what is needed on, on their, their side of their requirements. So the first thing you need is English, and you need that for four years. So four years of English you need, four credits. Okay. So is that four points? Yes, four credits. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So that's four credits for, for English. Now, remember, if you get all of these um, core courses in, then you can play in any division across America in any, in, you know, in any league. So it really is, a, you know, an important thing to try and do because then you're keeping as many doors open as possible to play college sports. So, so if that's four years of English, sorry to interrupt, but just to, I'm just thinking from the Camberlearn perspective from, from Cambridge, mm -hmm. you know, IGCSE is two years. Mm -hmm. Does this mean you have to have an A-level in English or is it, or can you, you have to have an A-level in English? To qualify, yes. or does two years of IGCSE and an AS level do it? Uh, an AS level will be able to do it because AS. How how many years does it take you to do AS? It's one well, year. Technically, it's one, but yeah, okay. but but like IG's a lot of two. yeah, IGs too. But like in the states, you know, not outside of and this is a this is a question and something that I wanted to address with you, Tam. Sorry to interrupt yeah. you, but okay, you know the IGCSE. So if you have five IGCSEs or O levels of C or better, most Division One Division One state schools will take you outside of the public Ivies like Vermont and New Hampshire. I mean Vermont and Virginia and. Um, Wisco or, or some of those schools, mm -hmm. you know, they'll take you with five IGCSEs of C or better, but the NCAA won't take you? Correct. So what will happen is if, for example, you go straight after your IGCSEs to university and you want to play college sport, what will happen is because you don't haven't met the requirements, you'll be an academic redshirt, which means you'll be able to receive funding. You'll be able to practice with your squad However, you cannot compete for a year when you're there in the States. So you're sitting wow. out a full year of your sport. And some coaches won't mind, but a lot of coaches that are competing for national championships don't want an star athlete to be sitting on the bench for of a year. Of course. And it's a lot and of money them. to waste. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, so you would have to do an extra year. Now, my question is, you can do English literature or the English language. Is there any other language, English courses that you could take alongside your, your standard English? Is there creative writing or anything like that? There is a literature course. So yeah, Cambridge splits it into English language and English lit. Okay. They're not combined. You could take a literature course, it's actually very popular internationally. So therefore you could take both. So you might be able yeah. to do your English literature and your standard English for your IGCSEs. Mm -hmm. And that's for, that would count as four credits. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. there's, way, there's always ways to round it. <laughs> there's always ways. Where there's a will, there's a way, right? There is always exactly. ways. Exactly. Absolutely. Sure. And at, at Cambry Learn, what do you do? Do you have a foundation level at grade? What's your grade nine? Foundation level actually is exactly what we call it because it's the foundation to do high school. Yeah, that's it's okay. the second level of school, but it's called lower secondary by Cambridge. We name it foundation because it is foundational to your high school. Okay, exactly. so perfect. Yeah. So they in the NCA would count your foundation. Yeah, so in oh, theory, great. yeah, you would do English and foundation. You would do IGCSEs you, and you then you do, do a, and then you do your AS. Yes. That's four years. Well, yeah, yeah and that would be the requirements. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So that would be perfect. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because, um, yeah, 
Exactly. You don't have to start submitting Cambridge certificates only at IGCSE level. We, uh, Cambry Learn does provide reports for the lower grade. You could you know, produce that as an academic transcript. Absolutely. Because exactly. I know they need to be converted to their GPA, don't they? Yeah. Uh, hook or by hook, they need to come out to, to a number, right? Yeah, yeah. And so exactly. those four years of English. Yeah, yeah. No, I appreciate that. You can do it. Yeah, there is a way. Exactly. So, so that's perfect. So that, that, that solves the English problem. Um, then you go on to the maths. You need three years of maths. So you would do foundation level maths yeah. and then IGCC I would do. be another two yeah. years. That would suffice. Yeah, you wouldn't actually have to take maths to your 12th grade year, which a lot of Cambry learners don't do necessarily because unless you're going to require maths for future study, you don't actually have to take it all the way to, to your senior year. So yeah, absolutely. That's an option. Great. Mm -hmm. So you've got four years of English, you need three years of maths, and then you need two years of, of, of science. And the states classify science either being life science or biology mm -hmm. or your physics and chemistry. So that's, that's two years of that. And at the foundation... So IGCSE would be... Uh, so if you do an IG in physics, chemistry, or biology, that would, ser that would suffice. Correct. Exactly. Sure. Yeah. yeah. And then you need two social sciences, which would be a history or geography. I do know they accept a, a business studies. They do accept business studies um, on the Cambridge system. If you were in a normal South African CAP school or IB, they don't accept business, but only on the Cambridge, which is very interesting. Yes. Hmm. That's yeah. interesting. Yeah. Well, you know, so, you know your 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 figures, Tamara. I'm very impressed. <laughs> I can see why Ivy says this is very technical. It does need to be. Eh? It's 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 a. I mean, I actually run screaming when somebody says, you know, they want to go, and then and then of course, you know, so many athletes. I mean, Tamara, you can speak to this. So many athletes who are really good at their sport, their transcripts are a nightmare because. Yeah. They, they've gone through high school until like halfway through grade nine, then they've done Cambridge and then maybe they've gone back to it. And, and it's, it, that's typical because they're, they're always trying to fit schooling around their training schedule. Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah, so sure. you I'm, unravel, I mean, I'm sure Tamron's can tell us some interesting unraveling of, <laughs> of transcripts. Yeah. So I've had a student that was at one school in grade nine, a different school in grade 10, and matriculated at a different school. So that was three different schools. And all different transcripts have to be sent to the NCA directly mm -hmm. from the school that the kid attended. That no. is, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, that's something else. Um, I've also had students that have done the normal South African CAP system. They've gone to Cambridge, and that was a little tough for them. So they ended up doing the American GED. Oh, my gosh. That yeah. is the trifecta of a complete nightmare, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's fun in games, but yes, as an athlete, you know, school is always, I don't want to say come second, but a lot of the time it does. I can talk from example, you know, I was, I was a hockey player that put my priorities on the AstroTurf and school kind of came second. But mm. only late in life do you realize that, you know, you really got to work hard, uh, especially... At, at a high school level. A lot of South African students think, well, my grade 11 marks are the ones that I'm gonna to use to apply to universities. Those are the most important. But we know America looks at all your marks from grade nine yeah. to the time you matriculate. So we like to get students in the program nice and early, you know, try and, and set them on a, get them on a path that one, they're gonna cope with, and two, they're able to then still excel at their sport. You know, that's, that's going to be really important. Uh, but getting back to these core courses. So once so I was going to ask course, you that because I'm yeah. counting the numbers and going, we only have 11. We need yeah. five more. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, so what happens is the, you need four years of a second language or you need to complete those four years with social sciences, sciences, maths, English, uh, you can do religious studies. Um, so there's, there's a variety of things that can fit into those, those four um, credits. A lot of the time, being in South African schools, kids will take Afrikaans, Zulu, they'll take a subject. 
um, with a different language. I have had some kids that have taken Italian and French and, and you name it uh, to get their, their right numbers. Uh, and then the last credit is either an extra maths or science or English. So that one's also a tricky one. So if you're originally taking you know, physics or, or life sciences in your IGCSEs, and you took one um, and you had your, your sciences at the foundation, then you should be okay to cover that. Okay, so you've got that extra year. Yeah. Mm. That'll equal 16 core courses. So if a child does an AS level and offer cons, let's say, is that considered three years? Let's say because a lot of kids don't do the IG and offer cons. Okay. Hey, am I right, Hugo? A lot of kids skip the IG and Afrikaans Very and they go right to AS right. because the AS yeah. is much easier than the yeah. IG. So does that only count as one year or does that count as three? Because technically you're skipping over the two years. One year. And going... So that's one year. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Hmm. yeah. Okay. So then they'd have to fill in with other things. Social sciences or a religious type of course, yeah. And history? Yes, that falls under social sciences, history and geography. Okay. Okay, so that. Yeah. So don't get rid of history, Hugo. <laughs> we, actually, we actually are not. No, I'm, I'm glad to announce that we've actually, you see that they changed the, the, the syllabus, um, Cambridge, from time to time. Every course gets updated. And we were in two minds whether we should discontinue it because it was about to be revamped. And then, no, we've got back the original author of our IG and A-level history courses, and they, they are going to be recrafted and we'll continue. I'm happy to announce. Mm. So, Yeah. Yeah, I know quite a few students actually enjoy history, so mm -hmm. they'll, be, they'll be good. Um, but yeah, more of what, what sports Spire Atlantic really covers is we look at cross country, we look at golf, soccer, swimming, tennis, uh, track and field, water polo, women's field hockey. Those are the big ones. Uh, a lot of the time we do get asked about rugby. Now, rugby obviously being super popular in South Africa, it isn't a NCAA sport. So it's actually not a vastly funded sport either across the States. So there's well over 400 programs of rugby, but the majority of the time wow. it's club rugby. Yeah. So there's not a lot of funding in it at all. Your funding will come from academic scholarships. So if you're scoring well on, on your, your SAT and, and got a good GPA, then you could potentially get full tuition scholarship at a university and just pay for cost of living. So that's an option as well. Mm. So we, we do a lot of work um, with rugby in the UK. So mm. we work with some of the top sporting universities in the UK um, who have great rugby programs. But the differences between the UK and the US is that in the US... I mean, I don't know, Tamron, what percentage of your kids get 100% like a full ride scholarship? 5%. To one, two. <laughs> and so what is the average that kids see? In the, in, so just to give you an idea, like in the UK, a good sports scholarship is 30% of tuition. So let's say a university, just for argument's sake, um, the tuition is 10,000 pounds. Um, living expenses are between 10 and 11,000 pounds almost anywhere in the UK. That's what you have to show in your bank account for your visa. So you're getting a 3,000 pound scholarship. Three, you know, 30% is 3,000 pounds. So instead of costing you 20,000, it's costing you 17,000 pounds. That's not a ton of money. I mean, technically it's really 15% because mm -hmm. they don't include the percentage in with your cost of living. Cost of living is untouchable. Okay. Um, so you're technically only getting a 15% scholarship. So I suppose, you know, there are, there are like I've been working with a couple of universities um, talking about, listen, if you want to compete with sports scholarships, you got to up that number a bit because you're not competing with the states with those kinds of scholarships, you know. Um, mm -hmm. If you want to attract, like, of course, in the states, not a lot of kids are going for rugby. There isn't rugby or cricket or netball, but you know, if you, you're looking at, you know, other sports, water polo, things that are played in the United States or golf, or, you yeah. know, you're not going to compete with no. that level of scholarship. 
<laughs> you know, you know, rowing crew, you know, that kind of thing. I don't know. Do you do rowing? Do you we have we rowing? do. We do have rowing. Yep. We hmm. do. So what percent, what is the kind of average amount that kids end up, and, and I know this is like a, you know, broad breaststroke, how, how long is a piece of string type question, but yeah. let's say that a child, well, let's take an example. A child is ranked, a good UTR ranking is what for, for tennis? So for males, you want to have a UTR of around 12 or 13. Okay. Uh, it's out of 16. And yeah. for girls, you want to have around nine, 10. And if they have a, a UTR of nine or 10, what kind of scholarship are they getting? If you're a girl and you've got a UTR of 10, you're probably going to go on and get a full scholarship. It might not be a division one, but you'll get a full scholarship. Yeah. Mm. And for, sure. for boys? Um, boys are a little different. We, we, there's, I don't know if you've heard of the rule called Title Nine. No. Have you ever heard of that? So it's actually a, a, a law in the States that Title IX states you have to have equal opportunity for the opposite sex. Oh, right, sex. For, for the opposite sex, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, so we do tend to find that our girls get a little bit more scholarship than our guys. And the guys aren't too happy about it. But majority of sports scholarships in America go to your, your football boys so the american football that's their obviously then pride and joy that's so, the money sport yeah exactly and if you've got 80 kids on a on a squad and a roster they're going to yeah. take up a lot of funding so they have to have equal amounts of funding available for the girls so the girls tend to get a little bit more scholarship but that's not to say boys don't get full scholarships you know i've got someone at weber state university in utah that's he's a tennis player and he's on a full scholarship uh, so it's very possible if you have a UTR around 13, you know, you've got to be competitive, super competitive. Mm. Uh, but the average cost of a university, let's say is $45,000, you know, that's tuition and cost of living. Okay. Now you get full tuition scholarships, which is probably two thirds of that. Um, and I would say a majority of our kids are paying between twelve and fifteen thousand dollars per year, so they're getting around thirty to thirty-five thousand dollars off every year. That's, for me, that's a deal. <laughs> no, <it is. laughs> Considering it is. what I'm paying, <laughs> it, no, it, no, it, it really is. is. Yeah, it really, really is. And as I say, if you're a top athlete that is going to SA champs and you're placing, and you're doing really well, you'll get you'll get scooped up really, really quickly. You know, I've got a girl now that is is looking to go to the University of Oregon, and she's grade eleven, and they're gonna they're gonna offer a hundred percent scholarship. You know, she's ranked what, what really sport? Uh, discus and shot put. Oh, really? Wow! University of Oregon's a great school. There's yeah, actually um, a South African tennis player there who's playing now. Who's was played with my daughter? She's on scholarship at University of Oregon. She's a Cambridge kid. Okay. Um, as well, but she didn't. She finished Cambridge, I think, in the UK. But yeah. So Oregon just yeah. built a new um, indoor facility, uh, an outdoor facility. I think their new athletics complex is. It's amazing. Just, University of Oregon is an amazing. Million. Yeah. Well, this, yeah, yeah. There, there's no shortage of money at University of Oregon. <laughs> well, the, the the guy who yeah. founded Nike went to Oregon. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, you know, when you talk about like football and the, the money and football scholarships, um, my daughter worked at the fitness center at, at Arizona State. And it was, I mean, the stories that we heard, it's insane what the football players get. You know, they get a little scooter to get around campus because they don't have time or they get their own personal dietitians and their personal trainers. And if you need a tutor, the tutor is available for you. They are royalty. They are the, the tenant, the, the football players are treated like royalty. They really are. But, but Sounds like rugby players in South Africa, actually. <laughs> no, it's true. It's true. But, yeah. but a lot of this, a lot of the student athletes are, are treated really, really well. Mm -hmm. um, I had a swimmer who, who spoke to me recently and she was at division two school. 
she had their nutritionist, nutritionist there. They had also student advisors that were constantly checking on them. You know, your physios, your athletic trainers are there before practice. They'll strap you up, no problem. Um, yeah, they take care of their, their athletes. They really, really do. So mm. it's, it's, as, it's, it's as if you're training as a professional. That's really what it is. They expect, you know, the best. Mm. No, they, mm. they, do, they, they really look after you. It's an yeah. incredible environment. Um, you know, I had a soccer player who was, who was playing at GCU, Grand Canyon University. And being a Division I school, they had to travel quite a bit. And all their flights are paid for, wherever they travel to. So it's really it's, good. It's really a nice, good deal. GCU has a good program as well. It's not, I mean, it's in kind of the middle of Phoenix, not the most... Yes not the greatest campus like it's kind of not i mean the campus itself is nice it's like a walled community mm. but outside the campus is not not really a great part of town but um they've got a good tennis program i know some british tennis players who went there on full ride scholarships um it's a it's a really good school no it is a really good school yeah yeah they have high academic standards for sure yeah no it's not easy he actually one of the tennis players i know was going to be an engineer and he couldn't he, he couldn't manage with the this schedule of practices and so forth and the traveling because every weekend of the season you're gone somewhere so he had yeah. to change his major to business so that he because he couldn't manage the engineering classes yeah and the labs and things yeah no, it is it is tough it definitely yeah is. hugo do you have other questions um i do um the this conversion the gpa calculator heidi you have raised this in a previous uh seminar that we did do you want to just talk about how that gets done because you know south africans don't have a gpa score so you know what's the process if you had to homeschool cambria learn study online so now you get these cambridge certificates and you get reports from cambria learn how do they actually do it what's the process Tamron, do you want to, I can tell you how I do it, but yeah, Tamron, perfect. maybe you, no, maybe you should, because it may not be the NCAA way. I'm so paranoid now <laughs> because, uh, you know. So, so the NCAA way is, it's pretty standard and, and simple. So your, if you obtain 80 to a hundred percent, they work that out to be four points. Okay. If you mm -hmm. score 60 to 79%, that's three points. 50 to 59 percent is two points 40 to 49 percent is one point anything below 40 is unfortunately zero so what they'll do is every subject that is uh you know part of the, the core courses that we mentioned earlier will receive a value from one to four okay then okay. you would add all of those subjects up okay divided by the total number of subjects you had in that year. So for example, if you had seven or eight subjects in your foundation year, you would add all of those totals up, get a total divided by seven or eight, and that would be your GPA for your foundation year. Then we come across to IGC, it's pretty much the same thing. You would add up all your credits and all your points for the credits and the core courses that you've done and divide it by those core courses. Okay, so that's the formula, and it doesn't matter whether you've homeschooled or like how you've done it. No, it doesn't matter. So whatever ends up on your transcript at the end of that year, that would be your final GPA. And then they'll calculate your GPA from your foundation, IGCSE. If you happen to do AS levels, they would add that too, combine it, and that would be your cumulative GPA. Right. Okay, well. Two or three years. So it can be it's done. much more forgiving, you know, like um, mm. there's who was telling us about grade inflation last was that last week that we were talking about how much grade inflation there is in America. So, yeah. Yeah. you know, because sure. in America, uh, to get four, you have to get a 90 to 100 to get three, you have to get an 80 to a 90 to get a two, it's a 70 to an 80. And a one is a 60 to a 70. So it's, you know, the, there's a lot of grade inflation in the United States. So with on Cambridge, um, you actually are kind of, the, the pressure is like a, a slightly less, you know, yeah. in a way. 
you know, to get to get a higher GPA um, with Cambridge because you know our you have like the range for a B basically is a sixty to a seventy nine. That's nearly twenty points. is quite significant. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it is. It is. So it's actually the same Cambridge um, calculation for the Cambridge system and the South African CAP system, or IB. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And then the SATs, tell us about that because um, or ACTs, I don't know how, how many times, you know, I mean, how, how, how often is it the case that you have to do those for the N the NAWC, what's that your NCAA? Your, so, so this is a, so, requirement. yeah, so this is what the confusing part is that you, yeah. that, so let's just, because Please the universities that I work with outside of the state of Florida, the state of Florida do require SATs, but we, with the universities that we work with in Florida, we have a pathway around it. So technically, except for the University of Delaware is the only university that will not waive the SATs. All of the other of our universities in the United States do not require our students for academics or academic scholarships to have the, the SAT. So this is the, the confusion. Um, the NCAA, so even though, so, so Tamron's dealing with a student with their academic and their NCAA application. So it's yes. kind of two-pronged. The academics may not require it for an international student, but the NCAA requires it for every student athlete. Am I correct? correct. So yes. you can go ahead and, and talk about yeah. that. Yeah. So the NCAA and the NAIA will both require a, at least a 980, but the, the SAT, you can write the, the ACT if you want to, but we find it to be less popular uh, because it's got that extra science section. So the SAT is just English and maths. Now the, the ACT has got the English, the math section and a science section. And a lot of South African kids are like, oh, I don't want to do science. Yeah. <laughs> it's bad enough. They got to do a, a maths test. So um, they tend to go for the SAT. The ACT was created um, and designed in a way that you wouldn't finish the exam. Okay, so it puts you on a lot of time pressure. While the SAT is also time pressurized, a lot of kids will actually finish the SAT. It's out of 1,600 points, 800 for the maths and 800 for the English section. Now, while some universities don't require the SAT for admission, what college coaches like to do is they like to say, well, if you get a certain SAT score, Okay, we can give you your athletic scholarship, your sporting scholarship, plus academic scholarship on top of it, based off how good ah, you do. So they'll it. piggyback. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. sometimes it's really important to do well in that SAT, and that's why a lot of kids also get full scholarships because they got a large chunk out of the academic portion as well as the athletic aid that the that the sporting program is giving them. So it is a benefit to do well in the SAT. And we, we always push students to do, you know, do better, you know, improve their marks because I had one, I must tell you a story. I had a tennis player and he, he was doing really, really well in his tennis. He got a great scholarship offer. Um, the shortfall was going to be around 16,000. Okay. And the coach came back to him and said, listen, you know, if you rewrite your SAT and you get a thousand points more, Okay. I can a bring a thousand that. points more. Yeah. So he was sitting in the, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So he was sitting in the, uh, he was scoring about 10, 10 on the SAT. No, but a thousand years. points. Oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, no, a hundred points. points. Yeah, 100 100 points. Points. I was going to say, no, a thousand points is like that. <laughs> but yeah. that's the old SAT. Yeah. Um, yeah. The old, old, yeah the, when it was 24. Yeah. <laughs> so 24. Yeah. I was going to say a thousand <laughs> points. That's off the score. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Sorry. If, if you were scoring a hundred points more, then I would be able to give you an extra $10,000. And this kid just kept writing it and writing it and writing it to try and keep getting it. And eventually he did, he did get it. Um, and he ended up paying, you know, six to $7,000 instead of 16. So, so it really, sure. really does help. Um, mm. So it's a good, it's a good motiv motivation to, you know, to do well in the academics on that SAT. Um, mm -hmm. And as I say, you needed to, to qualify for the NCAA and the NAIA. Uh, but once you've written it once and you pass it, then, then you're good to go. However, if you write it and you're not too happy with your score, you can rewrite the SAT as many times as you want. Mm. 
Do, yeah. The NJCAA doesn't require? No, they don't. So the only oh. thing you need to, to participate in the NJCAA is to matriculate. And sometimes they will require a English proficiency test. So you can do the TOEFL or the IELTS or Duolingo. I know yeah. these days are being accepted. So you could do one of those three. So that's interesting because we, we work with community colleges that don't require a high school diploma. Sure. So <laughs> you can not, not in Florida, in the state of Florida, not, but okay. in um, a lot of, in California and in Washington state, a lot of them will, will accept you without having a high school diploma. So you do a parallel high school diploma and associate's degree at the same time. Sure. So, no, yeah. I don't want to tell my athletes that they must, they must matriculate. <laughs> <laughs> no, but like, you know, if they want to play sport in a decent conference, they need to, they, they need to finish high school and mm. they, you know, they need to tick those boxes. Yeah. What, what yeah. is important when, when you do transfer, then you need an SAT score. If you, for example, go the NJC. To transfer? Yeah. If you transfer to the NCAA, the NCA requires you to have an SAT score, not the university. Wow. Okay. So, some, yeah. so, so, so you can go to the N NJCAA, not have an SAT, compete. But if you haven't taken the SAT, you can't go to the NCAA. Correct. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. You see, That's Hugo, this is why I yeah. don't do this. This is no, why we, we have Tamron. <laughs> It is. It is a minefield. <laughs> yeah. we, we actually um, suggest to, to our, our athletes that do go the junior college route, if they can take the SAT to take it, because once they've taken it, it's valid for, for three years. So they would be able to study for two, transfer with no problem, and submit that SAT score as long as they pass. So, so there's ways to go around it. Sometimes I feel that our, our students are not quite ready for it, and maybe they can write it a year later, you know. It's a lot okay. easier to write it in the States and less expensive if you can. Yeah. yeah. That is an option. Mm -hmm. So many different pathways. Yeah. Is it, can you take the SA, the ACT in this country? Yes. Is it given in Joburg? Um, is it given here in Cape Town? I only know I ACT. It yeah. It is. I've had an, uh, someone write the ACT before. Really? And they weren't attending at American I, I haven't met anybody. School. No, no, they were, they were at um, Pearson High down in Eastern Cape. Okay. I did not know that. Just... I've never known of anybody to take the ACT here. Like in the States, there are a lot of people who take ACT, you know, kids who are strong in science. And, mm -hmm. you know, the thing is with the state schools, if you go to high school in the States, I remember grade 11, my teacher, you know, you have to take the PSAT. You've got to start this year. You've got to start practicing and you go to, you know, you at school, you have review classes. And I know it's like that in the States now too. You go, everybody goes to review classes and it's just like a thing. Everybody prepares for the ACT and or the SAT. But here it's, there really isn't that, there isn't that culture and the review courses are very expensive. If you want to pay, you know, for a review course. Yeah, yeah. it's expensive. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. But the ACT, Hugo, is on a scale of 1 to 40. Is it 40? An ACT? 36. I think it's 1 to 40 or 1 Not to 36. 36. Yeah. It could be oh, so 36. Scored, you could be right. Scored differently. Okay. Yes. Scored yeah. differently. So it's a 1 to 36 score. Yeah. So it's three sections of 12. Yeah. As far as Atlantic, so you, it's so funny. We actually have a blog coming out this week, Friday, if you go to our website, about how to register for the ACT. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah. <laughs> it just so happens Please to be. share it with me. I Please will. share I it will. with me. So I I'll, yeah, I'll put it out there in case. Because I've got, I mean, Hugo's heard my opinion of the SAT quite a lot. I am so not a fan of these standardized tests. I am so, because I, I've, I mean, I don't know if you found this, but I found this a lot that, I mean, I was one of them. I could not even stay awake at the SAT, you know, let alone <laughs> do so well on it. And then it's so long and it was, and this is back, you know, 1980 ish one, something like that. 
you know, but <laughs> it, it was like, no, yeah, we're, we're not counting, but, um, but, you know, the English section, the English comprehension, it's like all these opinions on, oh, what would you title this passage? I'm like, I don't care. Just call it whatever you want. Like, <laughs> why are you asking this question? <laughs> and I remember going through it going, oh my God, let me just get through this. And, and then, you know, running out, falling asleep, running out of time. And then I Christmas treed. And then afterwards, my, my oldest sister said, you're such an idiot. You don't Christmas tree. You just fill in the same one all the way down because then you've got a one in four chance of, you know, I was like, oh, all right. Next time <laughs> I did, did C all the way down on my English and somehow got past it. <laughs> well, they do say that if you had to randomly guess every single answer, you should, in theory, pass it. Still pass no. it. Really? Yeah. You should. Yeah. Yeah. Which is weird. Um, See now that yeah. so so how is that a measure of how well a student is going to do at university? That yeah, that's what blows agree. me away because I mean you you can have kids who who cannot take a standardized test. My daughter could not take a standardized test. Those tests like make her go like mad, you know. Make her write fifteen essays in in an hour and she'll slam it, you know. But those standardized tests totally not her thing. And she could not crack the SAT and she's flying at university. So yeah. like, I've, you know. Yeah. I've had plenty of students the same. They, God, they just scraped through on that SAT, but now they're, they're at college and they're, you know, their GPA is sitting at 3.8. They're getting some, you know, straight A's and, hmm. you know. <laughs> what, so what use was the SAT? <laughs> Exactly. So what is the SAT a measure of? Absolutely nothing but patience. See, that's my theory. That's my theory. It's it's a disclaimer. That's my disclaimer. You can take it or leave it, but yeah. that's all. <laughs> uh, a lot of kids are like right. You can't get around it. So No, that's exactly it. For the NCA, yeah. you've got to do it. Um the only people that did uh benefit from COVID was the ones that were going in August now, who which was supposed to write the SAT in March or May. So I had a few students mm. that were going to write in March or May and go to start their college career in August. Because COVID happened, all the tests got canceled. The NCA cleared them of the SAT requirement. Woo that was a bonus. Yeah. yeah. So maybe it's a, a start of something. Um, but yeah, there, there were a couple that were really, really chuffed. <laughs> I actually thought they were allowed to do it at home. No, was home testing for SATs not permitted? No, they I think GREs or GMATs, GREs, mm. GMATs, and and UCATs, the the BMATs and UCATs for the UK, you could do at home. Yeah, the TOEFL uh, also you could have done online at home. Mm. Um, but no, so there was talk that you know if all the venues and all the dates were going to be cancelled, then they were going to try it online, and they really should have because they really messed uh, students around this year. Wow. So many cancellations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As we come to the end tonight, I think the one question that's burning, ladies, that we haven't quite addressed is, I know how the IE abroad model works. Um, if you refer out, Heidi, to Tamron, um, then how would Aspire work? Do they charge a consulting fee for their advice and assistance? How do, how, what's your model, Tamron? Yes, so so we do. We have different packages available uh, depending on what services you would require from us. So, for example, if you wanted the basic bronze package, we would assist with putting your profile together, getting you out to coaches, the real nitty gritty things of getting your 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 marketing out there and, and getting interest and scholarship offers through. Um, if you wanted us to do a little bit more with regards to the admin and complete SAT registrations, NCAA registrations, which is super key, uh, then you would choose the, the silver package for us. Um, and then if you wanted to go even further and want us to, to secure your visa and sort out all of those um, you know, transcript evaluations through WES or ECE, then you would you would take the gold package with us. So we do have uh, different you know, programs and 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 payments available. Um, we have payment plans over 18 months. Some parents pay us, you know, once off. Um, but once you're a member of the Spire Atlantic family, you're always a member, you know? So someone says, okay, so I pay you 18 months now, then do I pay you another 18 months because I'm only in grade 10? Um, no, once you've, you've paid us our service fee, you're with us for life. 
So you can go to the States, you can be at junior college and then come back to me a year later in September. I'm looking to transfer in the next year. And we would assist you with that transfer uh, okay. throughout the whole entire process. Um, you don't quite get rid of us that easily. Mm. <laughs> That's okay. huge. That's yeah. huge. That's huge. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. a big save. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. And, and they can get their details on the site or should they go through Heidi? Well, if, they, if somebody comes to me wanting a U.S. scholarship, then I send them directly. There is a click-through on the IE Abroad website oh, for Aspire okay. Atlantic. If you go into our student portal and to the resource center, there's a little blog about Aspire and there's a click through there. And then Tamron also has a click through to us on her website if yes. there are kids who are looking for international scholarships or education outside of the United States. Yes. So we partner that way. So if somebody comes to me, they'll otherwise you can go to aspireatlantic.coza. Com. Dot com. Oh, dot com. Yeah. Aspireatlantic.com. Um, and contact them or, but if they, people come to me, they'll, they'll get sent on to Tamron anyway. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. Okay. Well, on that note, um, it's been a pleasure. It's been mind warping actually. I think it's so technical this field. I'm glad <laughs> these experts we can defer to because I'm sure our audience also must have their heads spinning, but at least it's given us an overview of the process, the requirements and what assistance is out there. Uh, because, you know, this is very popular. Hardly a week goes by that I don't have a sportswoman, sportsman wanting to go on a sports scholarship to the States. I mean, mm -hmm. it's common. So uh, I will be directing people yeah, your way, absolutely. And I do always refer to Heidi for international placement, of course. So thank you so much, ladies, for giving us the, the roadmap. Uh, the detail, I think, might need to be on a consultative process, you know, child by child. Yeah. Uh, not about discussing individual cases yeah but it's been really helpful and um, and thank you for your generosity of time and for sharing your expertise which i'm sure has been built up the very hard way and the long way and uh and i think we mustn't uh underestimate just how technical this actually is and uh, why we need professionals like you to guide us because otherwise i mean how can an ordinary parent really navigate this an ordinary student it's too difficult to be honest it's so, it's so critical and you, so don't want to end, you, know, you don't want to end up with disappointment. That's, you know, you've yeah. got this dream, you want to go there, let's make it happen. Do it properly. You know, it's worth investing in your future. I, I really, I do believe that. So thank you so much, uh, Heidi, thank once you. again, what a pleasure. And uh, we wait with bated breath, Heidi, for the results of the US elections. Will they come out in the next few days? <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I'm, uh, I, I don't know. I'm taking very deep breaths. It's a nail biting I don't, one. I don't want to talk <laughs> politics because I've been told by my mother, don't talk about politics and religion in public. So I'll yeah. keep my well, mouth shut on that. I'm just thinking we'll of talk you about it later. <laughs> yeah, okay. exactly. Offline, we can continue. Okay, yeah. ladies. Thank you so Thanks much, so much for joining us. Thank you. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Bye.